what you're going to see is in the Western world, you're going to see people starting to suffer because of an agenda they don't quite understand. They can handle the heat. They can handle changes in the weather. Their ancestors have been handling changes in the weather for a long time. And as we'll talk about, we're better suited to handle those changes now than ever in all of history. But they're going to expect it to suffer. They're going to be expected to sacrifice. For whom? For the, quote, climate. For people in Africa, supposedly, who might have it too hot. For the residents of the Maldives, who might be flooded, although they haven't been yet, but might be, maybe one day, who knows. For some vague notion of it's going to get warmer, it's going to get hot, you're all going to boil to death. In the name of millennial hysteria, panic, Armageddon type thinking, and most people, unfortunately, Accept that until it really starts biting, it's still, until it really starts hurting their pocketbook, until they realize that they are expected to bear the cost of theories and ideas and consequences that they don't really understand and that are being pitched and being you know, articulated by you know, uh, uh, elites in the country by the wealthy and primarily the educated in the country that will only bear a small part of the cost of this because, or, or maybe that's not right. They'll bear a cost, but they can afford to bear the cost. To them, it's a slight hit. To the lower middle class and the working class, it's a devastating hit. And this really drove the yellow jackets, if you remember. In France, it was the cost of gasoline. The cost of gasoline because of new restrictions around climate change that the French government has imposed. And these people are saying, look, we, we live in a country. We drive a lot. You're wiping out our profits. You're wiping out our livelihood. We can't survive if we have to pay this much for gasoline, for our, our trucks, for our tractors, for, 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 for traveling. And... You highfalutin intellectuals in Paris, you might not feel it. You don't drive that much. But we do. This is our livelihood. And as the Western world adopts more and more and more of these kind of suicidal, high cost, low growth, or negative growth policies, more and more and more of its poorest I mean, when we're not talking about the, the, the welfare poor. We're talking about the working middle class, lower middle class, working class people, people who work for a living. They're going to start looking around and saying, wait a minute. Why are we being sacrificed? For whom and for what? We're not buying this. And this is why you get the rise of kind of right-wing populism all over the world, why you get the rise of the working class are going from being leftists to being rightists uh, because, uh, you know, people on the right, uh, you know, have lots of problems, but at least on many of these environmental issues, at least so far, they seem to be better. And the popularity of populist, rightist movements is growing among the lower middle class, among the working class because of this. And that's why, by the way, the, the, the right is moving left on economic issues because that's what its constituency, this new constituency, this working class, low middle class, wants them to be pro-welfare state, pro-government you know, uh, 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 intervention. Uh, they're, not, they're not capitalists. They're, they're, they're much more closer to socialists. But on social issues and certainly on environmental issues, they tend to be more on the right. So it's this complete realignment of our politics. We saw this in America with, with a lot of people who used to vote Republican now voting Democrat, and a lot of people who used to vote Democrat, primarily working class people, voting Republican post-Trump. We saw it in the UK, where now the North, the industrial North, the working class North, used to be the stronghold of labor, the stronghold of the, of the socialists. 
it is now the stronghold of Brexit. Not because those people changed their minds in terms of the economic policy, not because they changed their minds in terms of the role of government in the economy, but because they changed their minds about immigrants, because uh, because they, they, they didn't identify with the left with regard to immigrants, and, and they don't identify with the left with regard to environmentalism. Although pff, the conservative movement has moved so far to the left on environmentalism, I'm not sure there's a difference between left and right in the UK on that issue. I am, I'm starting to, to, to like the idea of Liz Trust, Trust I think her name is, as being the next prime minister. She at the very least admires Margaret Thatcher and claims that she wants to have policies like her, I say give her a chance. I mean, the other guy, Sunak, I think is too much of a moderate, middle-of-the-road, stand-for-nothing guy. Trust at least claims she's going to rule, she's going to govern from a Margaret Thatcher perspective. So that's that, let's give her a chance. She says that, let's see. Okay, back to Holland, to the Netherlands. Did you know, did you know that the Netherlands have 100 million, 100 million cattle, chickens, and pigs? I mean, how many of you have ever, I don't know how many of you have lived, uh, uh, been to the Netherlands, been to Amsterdam, or driven around the Netherlands? I mean, the Netherlands is a tiny country. I don't know, it's the size of Rhode Island, maybe it's a little bit bigger than Rhode Island. It's a small country, flat, much of it below sea, water, sea, sea level. That's where they have dikes. Justin says he's in from the Netherlands. Is he in the Netherlands or is he from the Netherlands? He's trying to have it both ways. Netherlands has 100 million cattle, chicken, and pigs. Justin, how many people live in the Netherlands? He's from the Netherlands, but I guess you don't live there anymore, Justin. Where do you live now? So the Netherlands is tiny, right? Uh, Netherlands is tiny. Danny's also from the Netherlands. So Danny, uh, 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 what's the population there? 17 million. So you, have se you have basically, clo you, you have what? Um, six cows, chickens, and pigs to every human being in the Netherlands. Like, I always make fun of New Zealand because there's so many more sheep than human beings. When New Zealand is nothing as compared to, um, as compared to uh, the Netherlands, where it's not sheep, it's cattle, chickens, and pigs, but 100 million, God, that's a big number. Anyway, it turns out that when the cattle, chicken, and pigs um, poop, is that the technical term? When they poop, and the manure is spread around. And then if they, when they urinate on that manure, what happens, and it, I hope nobody's eating dinner right now, but what happens when you do that, when you, urine, you combine urine and manure, what you get is ammonia, which is a nitrogen compound. Defecate, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one. When they defecate, and then they piss on the, what they defecated, something like that. Anyway. What you get is this nitrogen compound and ammonium, right? Unfortunately, this, you know, this excess nitrogen, this nitrogen, uh, by the way, very good for the soil. I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good fertilizer. But it runs off into the rivers and lakes and supposedly damages sensitive natural habitats. Whose natural habitat? Okay, uh, Netherlands is 16,000 square miles. I don't know how big that is. Right? So you get the ammonia, and it runs off into the, into the rivers. And sensitive, you know, it, it, it supposedly damages sensitive natural habitats. Now I wonder, is it the natural habitat of human beings? Is the natural habitat of snails? Is it the, I don't know whose natural habitat it is, but it's natural habitat. It turns out that there's a court ruling that says that in order for new housing units to be built in the Netherlands, 
in order for there to be new developments, the economic uh, real estate development in the Netherlands, this nitrogen has to be cleaned, has to be reduced. And I guess the government has passed a law that, you know, this has to happen. The courts have upheld it. No new construction until this happens. So the government has decided that they are going to, they demand that the farmers shrink the size of their animal li livestock um, population by 30%. 30%. All right, sorry, so Netherlands is 10 times larger than Rhode Island. It's still smaller. Like, I've driven through it. I've driven from Amsterdam to Brussels. How long is that? Two and a half hours? I mean, it's, it's uh, so that's from the Netherlands into, uh, into Belgium. Um, it's a small country. Although, you know, Maastricht is like that away. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, four-hour drive in every direction, five-hour drive in every direction, and you cover the whole thing. Right? It's also, by the way, uh, has the highest um, density. Where did I read this? Right, it has the highest livestock density in, 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 the, in um, Europe, in Europe. All right, yeah, it's, uh, wow, Puerto Rico is is double the size of Rhode Island. Wow. Yeah, well, you can, do, you can do the whole of Puerto Rico in a day. You can circumnavigate the island in a day. Anyway, so the farmers have to reduce their, their, their livestock by 30% in order to reduce the flow of nitrogen, reduce the flow of ammonia. Um, and the farmers are saying, and they have to do it now. Not in 10 years, not by 20, 30. They have to do it now. And they're like, you people are nuts. The fact is, the fact is that you will destroy our livelihood. We can't survive under those terms. And uh, that's what the demonstrations, uh, that's the demonstrations. Now, uh, you know, this is consistent Across Europe, you're going to see more and more of these kind of things. Uh, you, you know, uh, uh, Netherlands is a farming place. They say more than half of livestock farms are either going to have to shut down or they're going to slim down significantly. And the government is just saying, tough. You know, we've got, we, we have to shrink by 30%. You guys do it. You guys, uh, you guys are responsible for, for the nitrogen. You have to do it. I'm sure, you know, the farmers are saying some industry, they should participate. Is anybody really challenging the whole idea of doing this? I also wonder sometimes why is the Netherlands, why does it have so much livestock? I wonder if that has to do with government policy. That would be interesting. It would be interesting to dig deep into kind of the agricultural policy in the Netherlands and how much of it is really... Uh, this is the comparative advantage. And, and, and note that Netherlands is, a, is a, an amazing country. I don't know how much of the history of the Netherlands you know, but, but the Netherlands were really the first country, I understand the first city. Well, not the first. The first in the modern times to really be based on trade, based on free trade based on letting people, you know, make money. It was the first environment in which making money was viewed positively in, in, in the Christian era. Uh, you know, the rich were celebrated. If you look at art, Dutch art from the uh, 16th and 17th century, you see merchants being painted, you see uh, still lives that, that, that present this, these glorious, um, uh, you know, layouts of, of, of stuff. People were, and compared to it, it, people everywhere else in the world, including elsewhere in Europe, were super rich. Amsterdam was the place that had probably the most 
uh, freedom of, of speech. Uh, most of the radical books that were published in Europe were published in the Netherlands and then distributed to other countries from there, often through a kind of an underground of, of forbidden books uh, that spread over all of Europe. But the hub was the Netherlands. I mean, Amsterdam is this amazing, amazing place. I know some of you can't get beyond the prostitutes, but uh, prostitution is legal in, in many places in Europe. There's nothing uh, unique about Amsterdam in that respect. Amsterdam has this unique feature of having the prostitutes sit in windows so you can choose them in advance. It's weird, fairly disgusting, but kind of weird in an in a interesting kind of way. It's, it's worth going to see because it's so strange. But Amsterdam is definitely uh, was the bastion of kind of free thought, free publishing, free speech. Not that it wasn't repressive. I mean, just ask Spinoza. But you could get away with it, and 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 they weren't going to burn you to stake. It was um, it was a place that you escaped to, like Locke escaped there when he was afraid of persecution in England. It, but it was also a trading place, in, in, a, in a sense, one of the first cities that embraced markets, embraced capital, you know, uh, speculative markets, embraced insurance markets, and embraced global trade. It was the first place to, to, to completely embrace globalization from a, a, a trade perspective, and, and with a positive attitude towards it, not as we're going to go to these countries and get as much gold out of them like the Spanish and Portuguese basically went. And, and their primary focus was on raw materials, and particularly gold and, and silver. The, the, the Dutch were traders. And they, they were the facilitators of trade throughout the world. So what happened in the end is that Spain, in spite of discovering all that gold, got poorer and poorer. And all the money... All the gold actually flowed to the free markets of the time, relative free markets of the time, and that was to Holland and England. They got super rich. Spain and Portugal got relatively poor. Just interesting. Natural resources don't make you rich. Tell that to Putin and the Russians. They still haven't learned that lesson. Anyway, I digress. Why did I got into the history of the Netherlands, because Netherlands is a, is a beautiful country and an amazing country. But I wonder why it's so agricultural. I wonder if there's some something in the regulations, something in the way um, agriculture is regulated in the Netherlands that makes it, maybe it's subsidized, maybe they don't allow uh, corporate farming. I, you know, it's just interesting. Anyway, massive uh, demonstrations, thousands of farmers in front of The Hague, uh, all through this year, so this started in February and has been continuing. Um, and yet, you know, there's um, there's uh, little little that the government is willing to do, and uh, a lot of farmers are going to go bankrupt. Uh, a lot of farms are going to shut down, and the remaining farmers are going to are going to have a harder time making a living. It's interesting that seventy percent of the product that is, uh, that is grown um, on these farms, including the chickens, the beef, and the, and the, uh, and the pigs, uh, and the milk and the cheese, 70% of that is for export. And, and part of the thing that the environmentalists are saying, right, this is the attitude, that we export 70%, we export the goods, and we keep the rubbish, right? we keep the pollution. But of course, You know, you manufacture, manufacturing has waste, but manufacturing bring in, brings in capital, it brings in livelihood. So, I mean, this perspective is, that's always the case. The waste is where the stuff is made. But there's a big push now for agriculture to be local, not to export, not to import, food should be local. Um, uh, part of the big move against globalization and global trade. So uh, farmers are protesting. And again, we're going to see more and more of this because the environmentalist movement 
is not interested in human beings. It's not interested in our prosperity. It's not interested in our livelihood. It's not interested in making our lives better. It's not interested, ultimately, in making the world cleaner for us or safer for us. What they want to do, and, and you can see this in Germany, and I think the most, the most, I mean, the most strongest expression of this, the strongest expression of the fact that environmentalists don't care about human beings. They don't care about electricity. They don't care about our quality of life and our standard of living. They don't care how many people are going to have to die of starvation, how many people are going to have to die because of weather-related causes. They don't care about any of these things. And the biggest indication of that is that they're anti-nuclear. Because think about it. Right now, there's a big, there was a heat wave that went through Europe, and a lot of people died of heat stroke. By the way, I think it's like five times more people, maybe 10 times more people die every year uh, because of exposure to the cold than do from exposure to the heat. So even though a lot of people died this year because of the heat in Spain and in France and in other places around Europe, many, many, many more of them will die if there is a you know, really, really cold front and a real blizzard. Cold for human beings is far more dangerous than heat. But what is the solution to heat? And, and look, even if, even if we do everything in the environmentalists say, and let's accept all their models, and let's accept that the world is heating and we have to stop using fossil fuels. Let's say we stop fossil fuels tomorrow. Their models still predict that we're going to get a lot hotter. So what about all those people who are going to die from the excess heat? Do they care? Of course not. They don't care one iota. They don't care about human beings. Because if they did, they would be the biggest pushers, the biggest cheerleaders for nuclear power, for massive investment in nuclear power. In nuclear power, in enough nuclear power to be able to provide air conditioning to every human being on the planet Earth. At least in Europe, where they live, the Europeans of them. I mean, the solution to heat waves is a AC. It's AC everywhere. Let's get electricity costs down. Let's make them cheap, and let's make the electricity ubiquitous. Let's make electricity so abundant that everybody has as much as they want of it. And then everybody has AC. So why is it then a problem if the globe warms a little bit or, or a little bit more? I mean, as I've said before, people live in Las Vegas, in Phoenix, Arizona, in Tijuana and Guadalajara, Mexico, places that are hot, really hot. So innovate in the production of electricity, not solar and wind, intermittent, unreliable, don't work at night, which is absurd. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Brooks Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.